John chapter 1. In John chapter 1, we'll start in verse 35. Wow. John chapter 1, verse 35. It says this, and again the next day, John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. And Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What do you seek? And they said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, Where are you staying? And he said to them, Come, and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He found first his own brother, Simon, and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which is translated means Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. And Jesus looked and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. Hallelujah. Peter first heard about Jesus from his brother Andrew. Peter heard. I said Peter heard. Peter heard from someone else, a family member, who came to announce to him that I found the Messiah. The Christ is here. The Christ is here. Now, in context, you must understand that Peter is of the nation of Israel. And and, and in the New Testament, the four Gospels, they are spoken of as the Jews. So he is of Jewish descent. And so he knows uh, the writings of the the law and the writings of the prophets. He understands the history and lineage of his nation. And he knows as well as everyone else that they are waiting for this Messiah to come, this Messiah that was prophesied about in Isaiah chapter nine, verse six, it said, a child will be born, a son will be given, and the government shall rest on his shoulders. And there'll be no end to the increase of his government or of peace that he would come on the throne of David. So they're expecting this Messiah to come, this Christ, this King, the King of Israel, who will come and set up his kingdom that will have no end. And Andrew comes home to his brother and says, I found him. Every generation before us have been looking for him, but he's here. The one that has been prophesied about is in town. I've met him. I saw him. Can you imagine the excitement, the elation, the thoughts and the emotions that must have been going through Peter's mind when Andrew is saying, we have found him. It had to be mixed emotions because number one, he's like, this is my brother. He could be kidding with me. You know, he always, you know, pick, do different things, you know, brotherly things, right? Uh, In one sense. On the other side, because the whole nation is looking for him, he's like, my gosh, man, is this true? Could this be true? And so Andrew, obviously, in the conversation, did a little more than just say, I found him. He compelled him, says, come on, I'll take you to him. And so he came to Jesus. And Peter came to Jesus after he heard that he was the Christ, that the Messiah was here. And when Jesus saw him, he said, you're Simon, but I'm going to call you Peter. And at that juncture, because again, the four gospels don't record everything in the same order. And so a lot of times, if we don't watch out because we read Matthew first, the encounter with Jesus and Matthew looks a little different, and we think this is his first encounter. However, the the John account lets us know that Peter met Jesus before Jesus found him, came to him. So first Peter heard, then Peter came, and then Jesus spoke about his destiny, But Peter went home, and Peter went back to work. 
And Peter did the business of his father. Then in Matthew chapter four, starting in verse eight, it said, now as Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee. So obviously this is not the same account. This could not have been an after account. It was obviously a former account where he met him. There was a conversation. There's this passing off of John the Baptist to Jesus. And Andrew, who followed John, went over to Jesus and then from there went to his brother, said, we found the guy. He met the guy, but their lives continued to do as they were always doing. They're aware he's there, but their actions have not changed. They've heard and they've seen. They've heard his voice. Yet, they're still doing the same thing. But one day, Jesus, in Matthew chapter 4, comes by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, because he gave him a different name. Because you understand, Andrew, as the brother's like, you ain't Simon no more. You heard the Christ tell you, you're Peter. I'm going to call you Peter from now on. I'll only call you Peter. Right? So it, the names picked up. And so it says, and Andrew, his brother, casting nets into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. And look what it says in verse 20. Immediately, they left their nets and followed him. Here, Peter became a follower of Jesus. Many in the church world today are much like Peter right now. They have heard about Jesus. They've even come to him. How do you come to Jesus? Most come through the church because Jesus Christ is the head of the church. So when you come to church, you can encounter Jesus if it is the church he's building. If it is the church he's building, then you will encounter Jesus. Because the church and the scripture is Jesus. For in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. John 1.1 1, 1 and John 1.14 says the word became flesh. So when you hear the word, the scriptures, you are hearing from Jesus. And when you come to church, the one he's building, you'll be in the presence of Jesus because he's the head of the church, which is his body. So many have heard of Jesus from someone and even have been invited by that someone to come see him. Just like some today are here because somebody told you about Jesus and said, why don't you come to church and come see? And maybe before this thing's over, you'll be a follower. I said, you'll be a follower. Are you hearing me? So G Peter became a follower. But it's not good enough to just be a follower. Because here's Peter's heard of Jesus. Peter came to Jesus, had an encounter with Jesus, but went about life like he always did. But then when God called him, I said when God called him, he said, I'll leave everything and I'm going to follow you. And now here's the follower of Christ, the one who is going with him from town to town. Not only is he going from town to town, but he's seeing the miracles. I mean, he's seeing miracles, signs and wonders. He's seeing the dead raised, the lame uh, uh, walking, the lepers healed. He's seeing the blind eyes open. I mean, he's seeing miraculous things happen constantly. And there comes this time in the ministry of Jesus for he's preaching about the kingdom all the time for he said the kingdom of God is like this and the kingdom of heaven is like that and he's ministering along these lines. Then he would tell parables to people but then he would look to his disciples and say uh, to them I'm holding back this mystery or I'm, I'm, I'm not giving them the answer to the mystery but to you I'm going to give you insight. I'm going to give you explanation. I'm going to give you Hidden secrets that to the public I don't reveal, but to you I reveal. And so he had an in-depth insight to things concerning God's kingdom, his reign, and his desire for humanity. And then we get to Matthew 16. And in Matthew 16, verses 13 and 19, it says, when Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, who do people say that, I, that the Son of Man is? And they said to him, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, but still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. So he goes on to verse 15 and he says, 
But he said to them, but who do you say that I am? At this point, he wants to know your belief in me. Is it based upon what you've heard from someone else? And many people have a belief of Jesus only based upon what someone else has said. To some, Jesus, people have said to you that Jesus is the Savior of the world, and he is. But that's all they've ever told you about Jesus. So your only thought process is about Jesus is that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, that he will ultimately save you, that if you ask him to come into your heart, when you die, you get to go to heaven. And that's all you know about Jesus. Is that the Jesus you know because of what others have said? But maybe you're one of those that say, well, you know, I've heard about Jesus this way, that he is the one who saved us from our sin and is the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world and paid the price for our wrongdoing. And if you call on your, his name, you would be saved. But he also endued you with power from on high and the Holy Ghost that lives in you to bear witness with you. You're a child of God. He'll also come upon you and he'll give you power and, 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 and outward evidence that you have that power is that you'll speak in the language of the kingdom. The Bible calls an unknown tongue and you're functioning. And is that the Jesus that you've heard? Maybe you've heard that Jesus is the healer and that's the Jesus you've heard. But he crosses over and says, well, who do you say that I am? Because your revelation of who he is will determine what he is in your life. I said, your revelation of who he is will determine who he is in your life. And he said, but who do you say that I am? In verse 16, it says, Simon Peter answered. Are you hearing me? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Look what Jesus says in verse 17. He says, and Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Now, just to correct the tradition and wrong theology, it is not upon Peter that the church is built. Peter is little rock. He says it's upon this rock. Jesus is the chief cornerstone. He said it's upon this revelation that I am the Christ, Peter, that I'll build my church. Because he said, who do you say that I am? Peter says, you are the Christ. Upon that revelation that I'm the king, I'll build my church. Not upon the revelation I'm the savior. But upon the revelation I'm the king. And the king did save us. Glory to God. Our king is a conquering king. Our king went down into the grave. Our king was the seed of all kings that would come after him. Because unless a grain of wheat falls in the ground and dies, it remains alone. But because he was the king God and he sowed himself, he put himself back in the ground. It allowed him to harvest. When we come in Christ, we all become kings because he's the king of and the Lord of who are those kings you are and you're those kings now you rule and reign today but we're not like kings of the earth that are selfish and looking for power we're like our king who lays down his life for others and only does the will of the father but we do reign I said we do reign and we reign now and we don't have to wait till we go to heaven to get heaven's resources to show up in our lives. He said, now when you pray, pray this way, our Father. So many people pray this prayer but don't get the results of the prayer. When you pray, pray this way, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom. Come, your will be done on earth as it is. Is anyone sick in heaven? Is anyone broke in heaven? Is anyone depressed in heaven? So there's no reason for you to have it down here. Because his kingdom can come now. Physically, it will manifest. But we can receive from it today when you know who you are. When you have the revelation that Jesus is the Christ. He's the king. He's done more than just save me. He has set me up forever. He has put me on his seat. He has called me to reign in him. He has paid the ultimate price so I could walk in his life. And Peter says, you're the Christ. And Jesus says, upon this rock, this revelation, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. 
He said, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. He's given us keys because our father has chosen gladly to give us the kingdom and we can walk into the kingdom. We can enter the kingdom. We can see the kingdom the minute we're born again. Hallelujah. Because we become children of the king and we get to reign with him in this life. And the one to come. Hallelujah. Are you reigning? Yes. Peter has this revelation. He has this revelation that Jesus is the Christ. So Peter has heard. Peter came to Jesus. Jesus spoke to him. And it didn't, it didn't change his life. It didn't make him have a course correction. Although he had heard about him and even heard from him. But when Jesus said, follow me, when Jesus spoke to him and said, leave what you're doing and come to me, Peter dropped it all and began to follow because he believed he was the Christ. And how do you deny the king? Because when the king commands you to come, you come. Peter laid it all down. Then he has the revelation, not because he heard what someone else was saying, but because Jesus said, my father has revealed to you who I am. You have spiritually discerned that you have revelation, knowledge. I'm the Christ. You know, and I know that he knows that you know who I am. So a person can hear about Jesus, can come to Jesus, hear him speak, can ultimately follow Jesus and have the revelation that he's the king. And if he's the king, then we do what he says. Because his word never fails. I said never fails. I said never fails. Yet Peter, who's heard who's come, who's following, and who has revelation knowledge. And now that Jesus is, my father's let you know who I am, you have insight and information and revelation that no one else in the nation knows of. For I've told you, the kingdom of heaven is like, and then I explained the parable, and I explained it here, and I explained it there. And then Jesus went on, if you continue in the same chapter, it says, from that time, because they had heard, they came, they followed, and they had revelation. He began to show his disciples that I must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. In fact, one scripture says he spoke to them plainly about this. That way they knew what was going to take place. In essence, he's revealing to them. And he has said before this moment, because they travel with him. And they're like, how do you do this? He said, look, only, whatever I'm doing, I'm only doing because the Father's told me. I only do what the Father says. I only submit to the will of the Father. I only do what he says. Everything you're seeing, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Because I only do what the Father says. I'm submitted to him. Because this is how kings of the earth function. Because this was God's design. Because when God first created man in his image, according to his likeness, he gave them dominion. But their dominion was to be submitted to the Father who ruled in heaven, and they ruled on the earth. And I'm demonstrating to you what you lost in the garden. Because what the first Adam lost, I'm walking in now. I am the last Adam, and I'm the seed. I came from heaven, not of the earth, and I'm going to give you back what the first Adam lost, and it was the dominion for you to rule on the earth. For you to hear the voice of your king, for you to follow the voice of your father and, and act out whatever, do whatever the father says and whatever the father says, it had come to pass. And then he said, now let me tell you what the father has said. I got to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to suffer many things by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and they're going to kill me. But I'll be raised up on the third day. Verse 22, Peter Peter, come on, say Peter. Peter. Peter, 
Peter who has heard. Peter who came to Jesus and heard his voice. Peter who Jesus called and told him to follow and became a follower. Peter who has revelation, he's the Christ. When he heard the plan of the Father, Peter took Jesus aside and said, rebuked him. May it never be. God forbid it, Lord. This shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. For you are not setting your mind on God's interest, but man's. Here's a person who's heard. A person who came. A person who's following. A person who has the revelation that Jesus is the Christ. He, they've made the him Lord. They're following him. They know that he knows and the Father knows that they know who Jesus is. And yet they will willfully say, I got another plan. And there are plenty of Peters in churches today who have their own plans. They have their own plans. They're all, in essence, they're going to tell G Peter told Jesus, we're not going to do it that way. We'll do it a different way. Did Peter have some kind of revelational insight that Jesus didn't have, that Jesus later on in the garden said, maybe Peter's on to something. Let me ask the Father. Father, is there any other way for this cup to pass, but if not, let... No. Peter didn't have other revelation because he knew where Peter was talking from. Because he addressed the voice. Get behind me. Which tells me one who's heard, one who's come to Jesus, one who's a follower, who has revelation, can still have a voice, an ear to the enemy when self-interest is within them. Because for some, you know why it's easy to only show up on Easter Sunday? You know why it's easy? Because you are following who someone's told you Jesus was, and you don't even have the revelation of it. That all you got to do is ask Jesus to come into your heart and save you. So when you die, you'll go to heaven. And there's really, there's nothing you can do to earn it. So there's nothing that can happen to end it. And that's all you have to do. Now, for those that aren't in this, sh this situation, y'all should shout amen to help the other ones that are struggling right now. <laughs> Don't get quiet with them. Don't get quiet with them. Just go ahead and say Amen. 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 My pastor's being pretty bold. Well, go ahead. Be bold with me, okay? All right? Because we followers. We have revelation. We submit our will to his will. Because I don't want to be Peter. I don't want to be called of God and then question everything he's doing. I mean, I don't want to have heard him, uh, come to him, be a follower of him, giving away, change my whole life just to go in a direction he's going and then have the revelation that he knows that I know, that I know who he is. And then I'm going to question. And everyone in the room. God has a plan, purpose, a direction for your life, something that the Father needs you to do and is going to say, now listen, we're going to go here and you're going to hear that it's going to be uncomfortable, it's going to be a little bit of a challenge, it's going to be a situation, it's going to, there's going to be some issues, but he already warned us. He said, now look, in this life you're going to have what? Trials and tribulations, but be of what? Good cheer, for I've overcome the world. And God will tell you a plan like this. Well, you know what? Just forgive them. God forbid it that I ever forgive them for what they just did. We're telling God this. God forbid I have to go to church every time it opens. God forbid that I would have to serve the local body church. God forbid that I forgive my spouse. God forbid that I let this. God forbid. 
that I should have to put that much time into him. God forbid that I should have to study to make myself approved unto God. God forbid. Because a person who's heard, a person who's come, a person who's followed, a person who has revelation, and Jesus knows that you know that you know who he is and that he's Lord. And then he says, I'm going to speak to you plainly. This is what I need you to do. And you say, God forbid. Peter had his own ideas of how to accomplish the will of God, and many believers have that still. Because the reality is most believers really don't want to follow Jesus. They just don't want to go to hell. Just say amen anyway. I know we're talking about people you know, not yourself. I get it. <laughs> it's all the people on YouTube right now. Because they're watching on YouTube because they didn't go to church. God forbid I submit to a pastor. God forbid I submit to the fivefold ministry. God forbid I let someone hold me accountable. <laughs> because what revelation of Jesus are you serving? That's why Jesus asked the disciples, who do you say that I am? Because your life's going to be predicated on who you think I am. But Jesus said who he was. Well, I'm not John, although I was among him, in him. I gave him his assignment. I'm not Elijah, although I gave him his assignment. I'm not Jeremiah, although I gave him his assignment. I'm not the prophets that did it right, even though I gave them the, their assignment. I am the Christ. I am the one they prophesied about. I am the one they were looking for. I am him. I am. And you know I am. And since you know I am, here's the plan. But as long as we hold our idea on how we're going to fulfill God's will, because everyone in the room is not going to be called a fivefold ministry. You don't have to be concerned about that. It's not the issue. The issue is just, do you lay yourself down daily? Do you passionately pursue him and his purpose and, and so he can use you in the realm or the sphere of influence that you are? How are you making decisions? When things happen in your life, are you hearing his will on how to handle it? Or are you saying, God forbid I say that? God forbid I do that. Because he had a self-interest of how he would accomplish the will of God. On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he told one disciple, go ahead and go and do what you're going to do and do it quickly. And he left. And then the rest, he said, oh, we're going to take communion. And he served them the bread and said, this is my body. Then he gave him the, the drink and said, this is the, my blood of my, co of my covenant. And then he says to them, he said, now listen, all y'all going to desert me because the scripture says they'll strike the sheep, the, the shepherd and the sheep are going to scatter. And Peter was the first to answer. Ain't going to happen. Ain't going to happen. It's never going to happen. Not going to do it. I am not going to do it. I will be loyal. I am there by your side. I am there. I'm ready to die. I am ready to die. The rest of these, I mean, he pointed out his brothers, the other 10 that were in the room, the rest of these, they may leave you, but not me. I'll be right there. I'll die with you before I deny you. Then Jesus says these words in Luke chapter 22, verse 31, Simon, Simon, behold. Why did he call him Simon? Oh, y'all don't want to hear this. Why 
Why's God got to speak to your old self? Because every time you want to do something your way, instead of his way, he'll have to start talking to your old self. The one that's supposed to be dead. The one that's not supposed to be alive. The one that's supposed to be crucified with Christ. He said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. Because of this issue with you, in you, that you want to work out the plan. You want to tell God how you're going to live for him. You want to tell God how you're going to do it, how you're going to serve, how you're going to worship, how you're going to interact with the body, how you're going to interact with the world, how you're going to interact, how you're going to do stuff. You're going to make demands on him. You're going to tell him, I'll work this, I'll do this. This is all I'll do. Anything else, too much. I gave you, I gave you my heart. Get out of my mind. I gave you my sin. I'll keep my relationships. Hallelujah. He says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission. This is a guy who has heard, who has come to Jesus, who is a follower, who has revelation. He's the Christ who knows the will of God and yet is saying, you can't, God forbid. Because you're there, Satan has demanded to sift you like wheat. But what's Jesus say? But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. That's a very interesting phrase, may not fail, which tells us it could. And there are some Peters that unless you respond today, your faith will probably fail. Because you're more convinced in prayer to try to convince God to do it your way than have an ear to hear his way. Because you don't want to hear his way. You want him to bless your way. And so you keep coming and telling him that you want it this way and you want it this way and you want it this way. And some of you have avoided prayer because you've heard him say stuff that you don't want to hear. So you just kind of avoid it altogether. But you'll still come to church. You'll still hear about Jesus. And you have revelation he is the Christ. And he's praying for you right now that your faith may not fail. And when you, when once you have what? Which means he's turned. (coughs) Peter is a person who's heard about Jesus, who's come to Jesus who was a follower of Jesus, who has revelation he's the Christ, and in this moment, he's turned. He said, I'm praying that once you turn again, strengthen your brothers. But what does Peter say? But he said to him, in his religious response, Because it sure wasn't his heart. Lord, with you I am ready to go both to prison and to death. And he said to Peter, the rooster will not crow today until you have denied three times that you know me. When the rooster crows, you will have denied me three times. The one who heard about Jesus. The one who came to Jesus and heard his voice. The one who answered the voice of Jesus to come follow. The one who has revelation he's the Christ in his most vulnerable hour. Even in the moment that he knows him, sitting at the table, giving the uh, elements to him, talking about this new covenant that's about to be enacted. He looks at him and says, your self-interest is so bad 
that Satan has demanded to sift you and it can't stop it from happening because your self-will to do my will is, is at odds with each other. It's, it, it's at such odds, yet I'm praying for you. And it's at such odds that you're ready to deny me. And you'll do it three times. Because when the rooster crows, you're going to know. Then Jesus says to them in Luke 22, starting in verse 35, because he's, um, <laughs> some trouble's coming, and he knows it. And he says to them, now when, you, when I sent you out without money belts and bags and sandals, did you lack anything? They said, did you not lack anything, did you? And they said, no, nothing. He said, and then he said to them, but now, say now. now. Whoever has a money belt uh, is to take it along. Likewise, also a bag. And whoever has no sword is to sell his coat and buy one. For I tell you that this which is written must be fulfilled in me. And he was numbered with the transgression. For that which refers to me has its fulfillment. They said, Lord, look, here are two swords. And he said, it is enough. Jesus told them to get the swords. But the swords were not for Jesus. It was for them. It was for their own self-defense because of what's about to take place. Because of the scattering. But Peter, oh, but Peter, so he takes, they've got the source. He takes his disciples to the guard. He said, now, Peter, John, James, y'all come with me. Y'all pray. Pray. He goes off and begins to pray. Father, if there's any other way for this cup to pass, let it pass. But if not, not my will, but your will be done. He comes back and what's happening? People who want to do God's will their way, sleep. People who want to do God's will their way, sleeps. He kicks them, so to speak, and says, what are you doing? Get up. How come you're not praying? Staying attentive. I mean, you have no idea what's going down. No wonder you're going to be scattered. He said, for the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Don't yield to the flesh one moment. And when they had an opportunity to perform differently because they did not recognize the will of the Father, they slept. We start our prayer and fasting tomorrow. Tomorrow, 6 p.m. right here for the next seven days before our celebration of 20 years. Monday through Sunday, we're going to be in fasting. Fast ends after service on Sunday. The Spirit's willing. Let's see how strong your flesh is. Because I'll see if I see you here on Sunday, uh, tomorrow at 6 p.m. And while he was speaking, Judas, one of the 12, came. This is after the garden. because well, a mob shown up. A large crowd with swords and clubs came from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now he who was betraying him gave them, them a sign saying, Whomever I kiss... He is the one, sees him. Immediately, Jesus went, Judas went to Jesus and said, Hell, Rabbi, and kissed him. Man, what a religious word. Hell, teacher. He's not Lord in Judas's life anymore. And Jesus said, Friend, do what you have come for. And they came and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. Behold, one of those, say one of those. One of those. Say it was you, not me. It was me. All right, one of those who were with Jesus reached out, drew his sword, and struck the, the slave of the high priest and cut off his ear. When Jesus said, Jesus said to him, put your sword back in its place. Now, who was this? Who was this? Peter. 
The one who heard about Jesus, the one who came to Jesus and heard Jesus' voice, the one who heard the voice of Jesus to follow him, the one who had revelation, he's the Christ, the one that the revelator said, this is how it's going to go down. And I'm doing it to fulfill scripture. Yet Peter still wants to take God's will into his own hands. Peter was constantly overwhelmed by the emotions led by those. He could not control them, became the decision-making factor of his life during Jesus' time on the planet prior to his death, burial, and resurrection. Peter was making decisions based upon emotions, based upon things that were uncomfortable for him. He didn't want it to be uncomfortable. He didn't want to lose Jesus. He didn't want to be without him. These were selfish decisions. He was only trying to help himself. So he's going to show the king, I got you. I, I told you I'm ready to die for you. But Jesus says this concerning his thinking. He says to him, put your sword back in its place. For all those who what? Take up the sword shall what? If you keep trying to do the will of the Father your way, you're going to die that way. But he goes on, he says, do you not, do you think that I cannot appeal to my Father? And he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels. What? 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 Now, this is a very perplexing question or statement he makes in the form of a question. He just came out of the garden praying, if there's any other way, let this cup pass, but if not, now he's telling Peter in this moment, do you not, do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will what? At once put where? At my disposal more than a legion, 12 legion of angels. Is there somewhere in Jesus that he could have convinced his father, let humanity go? I'm not saying he could, but there's something about this statement that's pretty perplexing. Yet he sold to the will. He says, how then will the scripture be fulfilled, which says it must happen this way? And if we remain Peter's, who heard about Jesus, who came to him and heard him, who heard him call and say, follow. Who has revelation? He's the Christ. Why do we think we can go against his will for our lives and he's okay with it? Because if the Jesus you're serving is the one who died on the cross and rose from the grave so that when you die, you go to heaven so that you can live any way you want to on the planet because he really doesn't care. Well, that's not the Jesus of the Bible. That's what Paul said is a different Jesus. That's not my king. My king says... I will fulfill the word and be fully submitted to it. And you know what word he was fulfilling? Every scripture that was written about him. So if Jesus had to yield to everything God said about him, why do you not have to? 
And the minute we want to, God forbid, the will of God, then the king who's seated at the right hand of the father is saying, get thee behind me, Satan. In essence, he's trying to get you to recognize, quit taking that thought. That thought brings death. That thought will kill you. That thought is not my best. That thought is not where I want you to go. That thought, I'm praying that you will get rid of that thought, get back in the will. He said, I'm praying for your faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing from the word of God. I'm praying, Peter, that you will yield to my word and believe it so in your life. That's what I'm praying. And when you decide, I will do your word no matter what, then go strengthen your brothers. Because as I am, so are we in the earth. <sighs> Matthew 26, starting in verse 57. Y'all doing all right? And those who had seized Jesus led him away to the high priest where the scribes and the elders were gathered together. But Peter, say Peter, Peter, was following him at a distance as far as the courtyard of the high priest and entered in and sat down with the officers to see the outcome. Now the chief priest and the whole council kept trying to obtain false testimony against Jesus so that they might, what? Put him to death. Boy, the religion wants to kill the king. Religion wants to kill the king. Religion wants you to think he's only a savior. Religion only wants you to think that all he can do for you is save you from hell. Religion wants you to think that you're a sorry sinner. You're no good. And even once you're born again under grace, you're still a sorry sinner and can't do nothing and never do nothing and always be pursued by the enemy. And you'll really never amount. And just be glad that you're getting in because that's all he's done. Religion wants to kill the king. King. Religion always wants to sell you short of your identity, of who you are in Christ, of your sonship, of who you are. Religion always wants to kill the king. Now the chief priests, they were trying to put him to death, verse 60, and they did not find any, even though many false witnesses came forth. But later on, two came forward and said, this man stated, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. The high priest stood up and said to him, do you not answer? What is this that these men are testifying against you? But Jesus kept silent. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God that you tell us whether you are the Christ, the son of God. And Jesus said to him, you've said it yourself. Nonetheless, I tell you, after you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. You'll see, you know what that tells me? You know what that tells me? That tells me that all those when Jesus left the planet, they saw him go up. They saw the first ascension of Jesus. They saw it when the disciples were watching him in Acts chapter 1 when he left. Guess who else saw him? Oh, no. Then the high priest tore his robe and said, he is blasphemed. What furthermore, uh, further need do we have of witnesses? Behold, you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they answered, he deserves death. Then they spat in his face, beat him with his fist, and others slapped him and said, prophesy to us, you Christ, you king, who uh, is the one who hit you? And guess who's watching the whole thing? Watching them rail accusations at him, talk bad about him, running down, character assassination, talk gossip, lie, cheat about the whole guy. Then when he testifies of himself, a good report of exactly who the father said he is, for this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Then they begin to beat him in the face, spit on him, slap at him. And all the while, Peter, who heard about Jesus, who came to him and heard his voice, who heard his voice call him to follow, who had revelation he's the Christ. Yeah. 
Boy, there's many people in, sitting in churches all over the place saying, oh, I love my Jesus. Yeah, you love him so much, you can't hardly come to church. Love him so much, you can't hardly read the Bible. Love him so much, you can't come to corporate prayer. Because those sacrifices are way too much. In fact, Jesus should just be thankful that you asked him to be their Lord. My God. Man, what mamby pamby Christianity there is out there, right? Not with my king. And watching the whole thing. Peter, watching the whole thing. Oh, it's easy to say you'll do a lot for Jesus. I mean, we can't even do it in an air-conditioned environment. Can't even do it in an air-conditioned environment. I mean, there's already one who has the ability to dictate your life called your work. Yet if you are the one who reigns, why is your employment dictating when you get to come to church? And if you're self-employed, how is it that you can't reign enough to know Wednesday night's my night to go to service and I refuse to let myself go any further that would hinder my ability to come? Or on Sunday for that matter. I understand there can be isolated incidences. I don't have a problem with that because you know what? Anyone can sin and mess up and blow it. Jesus reprimands the one who practices. You've got to ask yourself the question, how committed and how many times are you? I mean, how much is it like very rarely do you miss prayer, the word, attending church, uh, serving in the local body? I mean, passionate about the things of God or is it 50-50? Cause I know in the room you heard you came you followed. You have revelation. Pete, you've seen the miracle signs and wonders. You've even done it with your own hands, just like Peter. I want you to go ahead of me, and I want you to do this and say the kingdom of God's at hand. And they came back rejoicing, saying, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And Peter worked miracles too. And now he's watching his king that just a few moments ago, before he was sleeping in the garden and got a little nap, was saying, I'll die with you. But yet at the barrage of all that's going on, because of self-will to do his will, he's paralyzed. Now, Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him and said, you too were with Jesus, but he, say it, say it, say it, he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you're talking about. When he had gone out to the gateway, another servant girl saw him and said to those who were there, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again, he, come on, say it, denied, denied it with an oath. I swear I do not know this man. I swear I don't, I don't know him. <laughs> A little later, the bystander came up and said to Peter, surely you too are, the, are one of them, for even the way you talk gives you away. And he began to what? Yes. Woo, he jumped back into Simon fast. <laughs> he remembered his roots of a sailor, a fisherman out on the boat, and began to start cussing. <laughs> F no, I don't know him. <laughs> You're full of S. I'm not going to say stuff like that. You know, preachers get up and say it to try to shock people, and that's just stupidity. He began to curse and swear, I don't know the man, and immediately a rooster crowed 
Oh, but I love, just so you'll know, the Luke account. That after this immediate in Luke chapter 22, when that rooster crowed, look what it says in Luke chapter um, 22, verses 61 to 62. Look what it says. The Lord turned. The Lord. Who hit you? Who hit you? Who hit you? Who hit you? Uh, uh, uh. Come on, get a rope. Put it on him. Give me that crown. Get it on his head. Yeah, come on. <laughs> Blood pouring out of his face. Crown turned and looked at Peter. The one who heard, the one who came, the one who followed, the one who had the revelation that he was the Christ. You think you're safe. We think that's because of the world. His own disciples betrayed him. Ones who walked with him, had church three years with him. Three years of church, greatest revival known to man. The greatest revival known to man. But I hear the justifiers right now in the spirit. Yeah, but Peter wasn't born again. You're right, he wasn't. But why don't you read about Demas? Why don't you read about the church of Laodicea? Plenty of examples. Plenty of examples. of those in the new covenant, born again. In fact, why don't you read Hebrews chapter six for those who've experienced five things with the Lord. If they turn away, can't even be renewed to repentance. Because nowhere in the Bible it says once you're saved, you're always. And to Jesus is one of his most trusted His blood, his face is swelling, looks at him. I just want you to know that Jesus is looking at you this morning. And Peter, remember the words of the Lord. And how he had told him before, the rooster crowed today, he'll deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. In John chapter 19, as Peter had run away, he had taken sides with his nation. Although he was not there at this particular moment, his absence had demonstrated his position because he was a Jew too. And when they were accusing him and wanted to kill him and are crying out, crucify him and are beating on him and the beatings didn't stop at that meeting, they just got worse because they took him over to the Romans. And Pilate honestly only scourged him because he wanted him to look so bad that it would cause compassion to show up in the religious. He said, we'll scourge him. And then I'll put him in front of him. Surely this religious bunch will feel so bad for their own because there ain't nothing wrong with this guy. And so with the whip, they ripped his flesh out of his back, sides, face, Rick Ranner's account of scourging 
is that as the blood's pouring off your back, as you're tied to a post, or your back's open, they strap you around a, a, a post down low like this, right? And you're on your knees, and they're, and they're in a pit. And as they're striking you and ripping the flesh out up, every time it grabs you, you know, and pulls the flesh out, that the, the, the sunk place you're in is filling with your blood. They'll throw salt in it, and then they'll come and pull that blood with salt in it and throw it into your back. The reason why they do that is it helps get your blood to coagulate so that you won't die from just bleeding out. And then they bring him in this condition in front of his own people. And he said, now the day of preparation of the Passover was the sixth hour, John 19, 14, and 15. And he said to the Jews, behold your king. And they cried out, away with him. Away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, shall I crucify your king? And look what the chief priest answered. We have no king but Caesar. And there's more believers today in the United States for sure that have heard of Jesus. They've come to him with somebody and they came to church. Then he called out their name and they followed him. Then they developed the revelation that he was the Christ. Yet they still let the world be their king. Where were you Sunday? Had to work. Where were you? It's Wednesday. You know what? It was a long day. How come you're not so well? You know, I'm kind of tired. Got to have my own family time. Well, your family's going to fall apart if you're not in church. I guess you're going to work your family your way instead of God's way. I guess you're going to work your promotion your way instead of God's way. I guess you're just going to go ahead and navigate through life because you really have another king. It's called the world's way of living. And then you want me to be compassionate and sigh and merciful and just say, oh, it's okay. Well, you know what? You can do what you want to do. And keep denying your service to the Lord. Because I can tell you right now, there's a lot of churches in our county right now preaching about Jesus dying and being raised from the dead, and that you should call on him. And you should. But you should call on him to be your king. And you need to forsake the king of this world. Because let me tell you who your king is. After all this, and Peter has sided with this, Matthew, John chapter 21, Jesus dies, is risen from the dead, comes out, a woman shows up, not there, runs back, says, Jesus is gone, someone's taken him. They're like freaking out, what? He only said he'd be raised on the third day, right? Okay. They run back, Peter was one that ran, walked in there, look, he's gone. One of them out ran him, got there first, they're like perplexed. The woman who told them came back with them. Perplexed, she's crying. They leave. She's crying. Just in, just, she's distraught. And all of a sudden, what she thought was a gardener shows up. And she's begging the gardener, at least she thinks he is. Where's his body? Just tell us. And then he says, Mary not his mama, the one who he cast seven demons out of. He revealed his resurrection first to a woman. Just like he revealed he was the Christ first to a woman. He said, Mary, and she knew he was the Christ. He said, go back, tell the disciples I'm alive. And make sure you tell Peter. He shows up. They see him. They're in awe. I mean, they can't even hardly fathom it.
Peter sees him. But he's perplexed. Because every time he sees his king, he knows he denied him. So he goes back to work. He's heard. He came and heard him. He heard his voice to follow, and he followed. He has revelation he's the Christ. And now he's back on a boat. And the Lord in his resurrection says, did you catch anything, boys? No. Throw your net on the other side. And they did. And just like a former time, the fish started coming. And John said, it's the Lord. And Peter <laughs> covered himself, comes to shore. Jesus has already started breakfast. And as they're sitting down after they eat breakfast, he leans over to Peter in John 21, 15 to 19. Look what he says now. <laughs> he says, Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. But look what Jesus says. And why does Jesus say this? Because in John 14, 15, he's already told them, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. He says, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He says, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my lambs. Second time, he says, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he says, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. And he said to him, shepherd my sheep. You're going to tend my lambs because the kingdom's here. The church is coming. There's a whole bunch of people coming into the kingdom. I need you to care for them. But it doesn't stop there. You're going to have to oversee their lives as they mature. This is a lifelong calling I'm bringing you to. I need you to obey what I'm saying. The third time he said, Simon, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said it the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And he said, tend my sheep. Because even as they mature in my body, they're always going to need someone to care for them. He said, truly, truly, I say to you, say when you were younger, you used to gird yourself wherever you wished. Wherever you want, wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hand and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. Look what it says, verse 19. Now he said these things signifying what kind of death he would glorify God. In essence, Peter will come to a moment that he always had a self-will to do the will of God, but there'll be another time where he will not want to do this, but not my will. His will be done. And Peter will be crucified. But he'll say, don't put me on that cross like my Savior. Turn me upside down. And when he has spoken this, look what Jesus says to him. Follow me. I thought he asked him that already. Our king was our substitute. And the day that we are traditionally now celebrating his resurrection, three days prior, he was crucified. And I perceive 
that some of you are stuck three days ago. Because you've heard, you came, you followed, and you have revelation, but you have the experience of denied. And you know of situations right now in your life, you keep denying Jesus access. And even though you've witnessed the resurrection, why is it hard for the born again, spirit filled believer to come back and passionately serve him? It's because they've been like Peter. They've denied his will for their life too many times. They know his voice, yet they've been submitted to another king, another way of living. And he just keeps trying to say, just do mine for your life. But on Resurrection Sunday, the Lord is asking you, do you love me? Because it doesn't matter how many you've denied his will, how many times you've denied his will for your life. Today, you could decide that you will only do what he says. And if you're at that point, then Jesus is saying, follow me follow me so if you're here today and I'm not asking you to bow your heads I, it's not a head bowing time this is a look up look around we'll figure this out because every one of us look I would much rather you come instead of just rejoicing with one if you know you are a denier you're denying things that you know God's talking. It's time to come show Jesus that you love him.